Okay, welcome everybody to our uh, Wednesday evening Japan Research Centre seminar. Um, I'm Helen McNaughton, I'm the chair of the, the JRC here at SOAS, and it's a real pleasure tonight to welcome uh, Forum Mitani, not least because she's a SOAS alumni, she got her PhD from SOAS in 2019, uh, and she's now a JRC research associate as well. So it's a real pleasure to welcome her here tonight to give a seminar. Um, Forum got her PhD from SOAS um, on the, uh, and her thesis was on the topic of gender, motherhood and family in contemporary Japanese television drama. And tonight um, is more about sex, gender and disability in media. So it's broadening out uh, her PhD topic and it's a new area of research that she's uh, making a foray into. So I know that she's keen to uh, present her work and her research and progress her new themes and get feedback from you all as well. So as usual, uh, we're going to have a, a presentation Forum's going to speak for about 50 minutes or so. And then you'll notice at the bottom of your screens that there is a little button there, a Q&A function button. So near the end of her presentation or any time during her presentation, um, please type your questions into the Q&A function. And once Forum's finished her presentation, uh, Forum and myself will come back onto the screen and we'll have a Q&A session. Um, we've got a good hour and a half for the presentation and the Q&A, so um, Forum's happy to take questions. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Forum. I'm going to turn off my video and, and leave it to her. She's going to upload her presentation, but um, it's a real pleasure to welcome her here tonight. Thank you, Helen. Um, I really appreciate the introduction and it's great to be here and to see so many people joining us and I really look forward to the talk and to your questions and comments later on. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to share my PowerPoint. Um, so um, to, be being, to begin with, I should say that I'm not a disability studies scholar. Um, my PhD research, as um, Helen has already briefly explained, is prim primarily it involved um, examining representations of single motherhood in Japanese media within a framework of gender, media and class studies. Um, and what emerged from this project was an interest in the way marginalized people are represented in the Japanese film, television and other forms of popular media and how feminism um, can provide a useful lens for better understanding such representations. Um, So intersectionality of modes of difference with regards to categories such as race, gender, sexuality, class, ability, and so on, is of course not a new concept. Um, in the context of disability studies, the feminist approach has been adopted by a number of Western scholars. Yeah, so in the context of disability studies, the feminist approach has been adopted by a number of Western scholars, including Susan Wendell and Rosemary Garland Thompson, who note the parallels between the way womanhood and disability are perceived. Um, in a discussion of female and disabled bodies, Garland Thompson observes that, that both are cast as deviant and inferior, both are excluded from full participation in public as well as economic life. Both are defined in opposition to a norm that is assumed to possess natural physical superiority. Meanwhile, Wendell has argued that it is no coincidence that architectural designs that make it difficult for those with disabilities to access also present challenges to pregnant women and mothers of young children. As Garland Thompson argues, viewing disability through a feminist lens can challenge existing social relations resist interpretations of certain bodily configurations and functioning as deviant, question the ways that differences are invested with meaning, examine the enforcement of universalizing norms, interrogate the politics of appearance, explore the politics of naming and forge positive identities. In turn, disability as a formal category brings new hindsights to the field of feminism by pressuring it to acknowledge diversity more thoroughly. Garland Thompson argues the physical disabled body constructed as the embodiment of corporeal 
in insufficiency and deviance becomes a repository for social anxieties about such troubling concerns as vulnerability, control and identity. Thus, disability discourse need not limit its politics to a specific minority, but has the potential to recognise how disability informs national ideologies of identity beyond that, um, um, beyond that, um, that might not explicitly relate to those that identify as disabled. And before I go on, I should say that I realise that I've made several references to the body and physical difference which is partly a reflection of the existing discourse and scholarship on disability, feminism and media. But I am aware that disability covers a diverse spectrum of identities and that some disabilities are more visible than others. So while most of the media representations and issues I discuss in this talk relate to physical disability, I will briefly touch on invisible disability, including learning disabilities and mental illness. Um, before I move on to my analysis of media, I would like first to provide some context by talking about disability, gender and sexuality in Japan. Um, so the complex interplay between disability, gender and sexuality um, has deep roots and can be traced back to early myths and legends. Take, for example, the story of Hiroko, the child of the Japanese gods Izanagi and Izanami who are credited with the creation of the islands of Japan. According to Shinto legend, Hiroko was cast into the ocean by his parents for being born with a physical disability. Um, as Yoshiko Okuyama and other scholars have observed, this story posits disability as a justifiable reason for infan infanticide. What interests me about this story is the cause given for Hiroko's disability the supposed transgression of his mother, Izanami, who had initiated relations with her husband, um, behavior considered unbefitting of the female gender. Thus one finds in this legend a number of interweaving discourses that demonstrate the close relationship between disability, gender and sexuality. You have the objection of the imperfect child, the subordination of women and the blame and punishment meted out to the mother for her sexual assertiveness. And the ways in which discourses of disability, gender and sexuality have intersected to marginalize and discriminate against certain members of society is apparent in Japan's recent history. Between 1948 and 19, uh, 1996, the eugenic protection law enabled the practice of forced sterilizations of those considered to be suffering from hereditary disabilities, echoing, echoing the age old notion that a disabled life was not a desirable one. The law had a disproportionate effect on women who made up 70% of those subjected to sterilization. The state has only recently accepted responsibility for depriving thousands of their reproductive rights with an apology and compensation. Furthermore, reports that women from Fukushima are being la labeled damaged goods unsuitable for marriage due to unfounded beliefs that the effects of radiation poisoning can be genetically inherited suggest that such discrimination has not disappeared. And sex itself is seen as a private issue in Japan um, and social workers who work with disabled people receive almost no training on the sexual needs of service users. According to Mina Yonemura of Shukutoku University, social workers operate under the mantra, let sleeping dogs lie, which suggests that if you just ignore the issue, it will not rear its head. Such attitudes came to the fore during an incident in 2003 involving the Nanao Special School in Tokyo, which became the target of a campaign after it introduced sex education classes for students with learning disabilities. The school had devised a special curriculum, including the use of visual aids and a song that featured terms for genitalia, which was designed specifically with the needs of the students in mind. However, it was branded obscene and excessive by conservatives and the right wing press who believed the students were being unnecessarily exposed to such information far too soon and moved to have the classes stopped, the teaching materials confiscated and the teachers punished. The school was eventually successful in bringing a lawsuit against the authorities and the media. Um, and although these events occurred during a wider backlash against gender free policies and sex education in schools, 
The social discourse surrounding them is indicative of the extent to which people with disabilities are infantilized as innocent and passive, incapable of autonomous thought or expression, somewhat contradicting the assumption that sex education would put improper thoughts in the minds of innocence. It was revealed that the school devised the curriculum in the first place because teachers had already observed sexual behavior among the students. And in recent years, disability rights activists have increasingly pushed back against the stereotype of disabled people as sexually innocent and passive. For example, Yoshihiko Kumashino, who describes his work as helping horny disabled people, founded nonprofit organization NPO Noir to campaign for better awareness of the sexual needs of dis people with disabilities. Kumashino, a wheelchair user born with cerebral palsy, speaks and writes ex extensively on disability and sexuality, including accessible love hotels and sex worker services. He published a memoir about his experiences that became the basis for the Japanese comedy Perfect Revolution, released in 2017, and I'll be discussing this film in more detail later. Um, due to the work of people like Kumashino, there now exist a range of sexual services aimed at the disabled community. However, most are designed to fulfill male needs, ignoring the desires of disabled women. For example, Hiroko Yasuda notes that while there are support service to help, services to help physically disabled men masturbate, there does not appear to be equivalent assistance for women. Disabled women in Japan face extreme social pressure not to be a burden to others, which often discourages them from asserting their needs and desires. When they do so, they may face rejection or abuse. Yasuda's analysis of autobiographies authored by disabled women found instances of women who were discouraged from wearing feminine clothing or encouraged to have a hysterectomy to avoid getting pregnant because they believed raising a child as a disabled woman was not possible. She finds that when disabled women do engage with their sexuality, their experiences may range from positive account encounters of self-validation to negative interactions that can even involve force, um, which, you know, is something, an experience that, you know, does not limit itself to women um, who are disabled. Um, an interview with disabled activists Ryoko Nakajima and Eri Umetsu in 2019 reveals the extent to which disabled women talking about sex continues to be a taboo in the mainstream media. The interviewer opens with the question, why did you decide to cooperate with this article on sex revealing your real name and face? Nevertheless, um, Nakajima and Umetsu spoke openly about their experiences of love and romance as disabled women in their 30s and 40s. Umetsu, who was very keen to become a mother, described the rehabilitation she underwent to prepare her body for sex with her husband. However, she admitted she was only able to ask for help because her occupational therapist was a young woman and believed that most disabled women would struggle to request the assistance they might need both out of a sense of embarrassment and a wish not to burden others. Meanwhile, Nakajima spoke frankly of her experience of online dating and sex as a woman with paraplegia, including details such as the risk of bladder leakage during intimacy. Nakajima and Umetsu, who regularly appear in the media, have founded a, a group called Beyond Girls, which I would describe as something like an all-female body positivity group to dispel stereotypes of disabled women and celebrate their femininity. So the reluctance to view disabled women as sexual beings has manifested itself in representations of disability on screen, which have tended to romanticize disabled women as persevering, heroic, and essentially asexual. Martin Norden uses the term sweet innocent to describe such cultural representations a sweet innocent is typically a child or young unmarried woman who is respectful, humble, gentle, cheerful, godly, pure, and exceptionally pitiable, far more reactive than proactive and seems to bring out the protectiveness of every good hearted able bodied person who comes their way. While there is a dearth of research when it comes to representations of disability in recent Japanese film and media, Aaron Stibb has 
previously observed that Japanese television dramas featuring disabled characters of the 90s and 2000s conform to the traditional gender dynamic. Disabled female characters were idealized for displaying perseverance, enduring their suffering without complaint, and were often protected by men, while male disabled characters often acted as the protectors of able-bodied women. More recently in her work on manga, Okuyama has observed how disability, which is tied to negative stereotypes of victimhood and weakness, can be framed as a sign of diminished masculinity. I would say these stereotypes continue to be perpetuated in contemporary Japanese media. To demonstrate this, I would like to, to use the concept of the gaze, which has become well established in feminist film and media studies, and is also being adopted as a framework for analysis in disability studies. Whereas feminist film scholars talk of the male or female gaze, disability scholars have spoken of the ableist gaze, which not only signifies the perspective from which disabled people are looked at, um, that of the non-disabled majority, but also signifies a system of power relations whereby the gazer, the abled, is superior to the object of its gaze, the disabled. To illustrate this point, I would like to briefly discuss the television drama Perfect World, which aired on Fuji Television in 2019. Perfect World was adapted from the popular award-winning manga of the same name, which was also adapted as a feature-length film. For more on the manga, please read Okuyama's analysis and discussion in her book on disability in manga. But to summarise, it's a story, it's a love story basically, featuring an able-bodied um, um, character, male character called Tsugumi, um, sorry, able-bodied female character Tsugumi and her former schoolmate Itsuki, who uses a wheelchair. Admittedly, the drama adaptation, as well as its source material, is written from the perspective of Tsugumi. Nevertheless, the opening scene where Tsugumi learns for the first time that Itsuki is now disabled presents us with a typical example of the ableist gaze. Um, and I was going to play the clip, but I don't think that it's we're going to work. So um, I'm just going to describe it. Um, so basically, um, the scene is set in it's an in is a izakaya, and Itsuki and Suzuki, um, Tsugumi are reunited for the first time after um, many years many years after they um, graduate, lost each other when they graduate from high school. Um, and so Tsugumi is not aware that in the intervening years, um, Itsuki has um, become, um, has, is now using a wheelchair following a car crash. Um, so we see the moment that she, she realizes and we the view our, our viewers ourselves um, realize for the first time that, um, you know, this, this young once, you know, this young sort of seemingly virile man is now a wheelchair user. And um, the scene, the way the scene works, it repeatedly cuts back, um, back and forth between um, Itsuki and Tsugumi. And by repeatedly cutting back to Tsugumi's crestfallen face as she watches Itsuki maneuver himself across the room and into his wheelchair, the focus remains very much on her reaction to discovering that her former classmate who was once a star player on the school basketball team is no, lo no longer able to walk. The sentimental music that plays over this further emphasizes the ableist perspective, underscoring the shock, disappointment and pity that Tsugumi and the presumably able-bodied viewer is meant to feel for her one-time crush. At the same time, the extended shots of Itsuki settling himself into his wheelchair as he puts on his shoes enables us to indulge in what scholars refer to as staring from the safety of their home. The viewer is able to indulge in their curiosity and desire for a body-based spectacle without any risk of social opprobrium. Okuyama has likened such practices to those of spectators at 19th century freak shows. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can try to play it. Okay. Mm. Oh. 
うん、ID 書いとくから検索して分かった、うん、すごいや湯川くん夢かな相川さんここ置いてきますよありがとうじゃあお疲れですお疲れ様ですお疲れ様ですカーナまたゆっくりな<音声>サンキューお疲れ様でしたお疲れ Stop it there and go back to the PowerPoint. Nicole Markotic has de demonstrated how the staging of pity、um, can be subverted through screen representations of unlikable disabled characters who wield power.、Um, but in this case, Perfect World only doubles down on the pity factor. Later in the episode, Itsuki has an emotional breakdown after accidentally wetting himself in public and is hospital hospitalized with terrible sores from extended wheelchair use. In both cases, Tsugumi comes to the rescue, shielding him from embarrassment and helping him to meet work deadlines from his hospital bed. Demasculinized by his inability to control his body or his emotions, The audience is forced to see Itsuki as unfortunate. His protestations that he doesn't want to be pitied by others, said through frustrated tears as he lies prone on the hospital floor of his, hosp on the floor of his hospital room, ironically only serves to induce more pity. Seeing him in such a wretched state in this first episode, the viewer is invited to admire not only Itsuki's subsequent bravery in overcoming his difficulties. But also Tsugumi's sacrifice in choosing the difficult path of becoming the partner of a disabled person. Modeling a patriarchal view of gender relations, Itsuki and Tsugumi's relationship faces resistance from her father, who believes that as a disabled man, Itsuki will not be able to take on the protector role that is traditionally expected of a husband. It is only after Itsuki saves his future father in law's life and offers emotionally, emotional support to Tsugumi during her father's hospitalization that he is able to regain his masculinity and acceptance as a suitable son in law. So,、um, and、um, I think one would argue that this is、um, the、um, perfect world is a very clear、um, example of what.、Um, um, Disability scholars and activists have referred to as inspiration porn.、Um, and um, inspiration porn、um, is basically、um, sort of very um, emotional um, media that is um, used. Um, Uses sort of very sort of inspirational stories to in, of disabled people overcoming adversity to inspire.、Um, To,、um, to inspire an emotion, emotional response, to provoke an emotional response from、um, viewers、um, who are mostly able bodied. And、um, that, you know, many disability activists have now spoken out against、um, the use of the way the media objectifies、um, disabled people in this way.、Um, one of them being Stella Young,、um, an Australian activist、um, who's、um, 
a TED talk you can see on, on YouTube um, called I'm Not Your Inspiration, Thank You Very Much. And Stella Young very much rejects the label of being an inspiration um, and um, wants to, has called for more sort of normalized um, images of disabled people just doing, um, rather than these sorts of really um, inspirational images. Um, and um, Nicole Marcotic has described um, inspiration porn as um, basically the flip side of pity because um, it induces an emotional response on the basis that um, these disabled people are their lives, they're doing things that a normal, a so-called normal person would not be able to um, cope with. Um, and the media's use of inspiration porn, which is known as kando porn, podno in Japanese, has been criticized um, in Japan too. In 2016, the NHK show Baribara, um, which is short for Barrier Free Variety Show, um, which is a regular show that um, um, is broadcast once a week in, on NHK um, it, and it features disabled presenters and guests and regularly tackles issues related to disability and diversity. Um, in 2016, it introduced um, and discussed the topic of inspiration porn. Um, it aired a parody of a typical inspiration porn documentary and common, um, that is commonly aired on television, particularly during charity fundraising television programs and invited comments from panelists and viewers. They carried out a survey of viewers during the show, which found that while 45% of non-disabled people admitted to enjoying inspiration porn programs, only 10% of disabled people felt the same. So there is clearly some work to do in order to diversify the kinds of images and messages of disability, the mainstream media, which have an enormous influence on the way society perceives people who identify as disabled. One film that has gone some way towards resisting ableist and inspirational representations of disability is the 2017 film Perfect Revolution, um, which, as I mentioned earlier, is based on the memoir of disability activist Yoshihiko Kumashino. Um, the film follows the tumultuous relationship between best-selling author Kuma, played by Lily Frankie, and sex worker Mitsu, played by Nana Seino. While the film is essentially an uplifting romantic comedy, its unapologetic celebration of the sexuality of disabled people and its refusal to conform to the sweet innocent stereotype is no particularly noteworthy. From the very first scene, as we watch him lecherously peering up the skirt of a young woman standing on a ladder, we are made explicitly aware that Kuma, a middle-aged wheelchair user with cerebral palsy, does not fit the mould of um, pure-hearted, asexual, passive victim that mainstream society has come to expect. He's a cynical, single man who has given up on finding love but has a strong sex drive a situation that is probably relatable um, for many disabled and able-bodied men alike in contemporary Japan. While the scene is far from politically correct in terms of its objectification of a woman's body, it does serve to humanize Kuma, who to use his own words is neither monster nor saint. As such, it avoids the trap of simplistic binaries of good and bad that many representations of disability fall into. And the film is highly critical of the way the mainstream media portrays disability. For example, at a press event to publicize Kuma's book, a photographer asks if he can take a picture of only his hands, which are a visible marker of his difference. Kuma, who up until that moment was in good spirit, suddenly tenses up. Um, and while the, camera, the still camera um, and the attention of the able-bodied photographer fixes on his hands, the video camera and the viewer is focused on his face, capturing his discomfort at being reduced to his non-normative body parts. This scene marks a contrast from the earlier one in Perfect World, demonstrating the objectifying, dehumanizing impact of the ableist gaze. And further criticism appears later in the film when a television crew comes to shoot an interview with wheelchair bound, uh, wheelchair user, the wheelchair user protagonist and his girlfriend Mitsu, 
for what is clearly planned as an inspiration porn segment. Unhappy with their cheerful appearance and demeanor, the crew members ask them to turn, tone down their clothing and makeup and focus on the hardships they have encountered to create a mood more in keeping with disability. Mitsu is also asked not to speak so positively about her sex work. And um, I'm going to try and show you a clip of that too. Okay, so as I said, this is a scene um, when a, a TV crew come to um, film an interview with Kuma and Mitsu. And I'm afraid, sorry, I should have said that um, there's, unfortunately, it's, there's no English um, with this video. There's only Japanese subtitles, I'm afraid. Um, but I'll explain what, what happens. すみません、ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。ソープ。
um, or sex work. Um, and Perfect Revolution also reveals the contrasting ways in which visible and, vi and invisible disabilities are perceived by society. Scholars have noted that the latter can struggle more than the former to navigate public spaces and are more likely to be misunderstood due to society's perception of what disability should look like. And this is made apparent in different ways in which, the different ways in which Kuma a physically disabled man and Mitsu, an able-bodied woman with a personality disorder, um, are um, treated. Kuma, whose disability is made visible through his non-normative body and use of an electric wheelchair, is more successful in navigating public spaces, even forging a career as a best-selling author. He is accommodated through a range of strategies such as the provision of ramps, the assistance of a carer, or being physically carried on his brother's back. Mitsu, on the other hand, fails time and again to conform to the expectations of others because her disability, a mental illness, is not immediately visible. Society expects her to act as a non-disabled person would and is less accommodating of her difference. Thus, when she fails to meet these expectations by, for example, physically attacking others or throwing food, she loses her right to access social spaces and is eventually institutionalized. This underscores the disparities in the extent to which society is able or willing to accommodate, accommodate different types of disability in Japan and elsewhere. Having said this, the representation of Mitsu's illness is not an unproblematic one. Some would justifiably object to the depiction of her attempt to commit murder-suicide by dragging Kuma's wheelchair into the sea, which may serve to reinforce negative stereotypes of people suffering from mental illness as dangerous not only to themselves, but also to others. Nevertheless, I would argue Perfect Revolution offers a representation of a disability, of disability that is refreshing, honest and authentic. What lends it its authenticity is the involvement of disabled people in the production, including Kumashino, who not only wrote the source material, but also acted as an on-set consultant during filming. A close friend of the lead actor, Lily Frankie, the two spent many hours together so Frankie could observe his mannerisms. As such, it shares similarities with the film 37 Seconds, which features a similarly frank story of a wheelchair user exploring their sexuality, but focuses on a woman's point of view. Um, so we're going to talk, I'm going to talk now about 37 Seconds, um, a film that um, was um, first released in 2019 and is available on Netflix, by the way, if anybody um, wants to watch it. Um, so, um, in 37 seconds, the most striking and arguably most important scene comes early in the film, a mere three and a half minutes in when protagonist Yuma is carefully undressed and washed by her mother Kyoko. The camera is un unflinching as Yuma, a 23 year old Japanese woman born with cerebral palsy, crouches nude on the bathroom floor. The power of the image lies in its depiction of a naked form that is at once mature yet vulnerable soothingly familiar yet also disconcerting. Were it not for Yuma's non-normative body, the sight of a mother and daughter taking a bath together could easily be overlooked. This mundanity imbues the scene with the humanity that makes it all the more significant. As film critic Caroline Hines points out in her blog post following the film's premiere um, at the Toronto International Film Festival, it is both intimate and necessary. 37 Seconds tells the story of Yuma Takada, um, who's portrayed by Mei Kayama, a paraplegic manga artist who breaks free from the restricting confines of her sheltered life to embark on a journey of sexual and personal discovery. US-based Japanese writer-director Hikari um, had a history of creating progressive narratives of sexuality. Her previous work includes Tsuyako, a short film centered on a lesbian love affair in post-war -war Japan. Um, and Hikari was inspired to create 37 Seconds after meeting wheelchair users, therapists working uh, with disabled clients and disabled activists, including Yoshi Hiko uh, Kumashino, who also has a small role in the film. And what sets 37 Seconds apart from Perfect Revolution is 
the casting of Mei Kayama, also a wheelchair user born with cerebral palsy, in her first acting role. Hikari has revealed that this was the one casting decision that she was absolutely insistent on. And this groundbreaking decision had a significant impact on the production process. The crew, the crew put in place a number of provisions to accommodate the needs of Kayama during filming, including engaging a carer to support her and scheduling more than double the time normally required for a typical shoot. During the script writing process, Hikari also rented a wheelchair herself to get a better understanding of her protagonist. This perspective is translated to the screen in the scenes where the camera is positioned at Yuma's height, giving the viewers an opportunity to see the world through her eyes. So privileging her gaze rather than the ablest one. And focusing on a female heroine was another progressive choice. The stories of women with disabilities exploring their sexuality are rarely told. Shonali Bose's um, Margarita with a Straw from 2014 is a notable exception. The first part of the film, that this film, 37 Seconds, charts Yuma's sexual awakening as she watches pornography, mas masturbates and tries online dating. These early moments, Yuma's broad grin after she lies to her mother about where she is going, the comically awkward first dates, the disappointment of being stood up, are all the more resonant for their relatability as universal experiences of youth. Nevertheless, the film does not shy away from the specific challenges that come with being a sexually mature woman with a disability in Japan. Hikari and producer Shin Yamaguchi aim to highlight the gender disparity in the recognition of sexual rights of people with disabilities. And this discrepancy is made apparent in the contrasting sexual experiences of the two disabled characters who appear in the film, protagonist Yuma and Mr. Kuma, who's portrayed by Kuma Shino. The sensual connection between Mr. Kuma and his paid companion Mai, who is played by Makiko Watanabe, is undeniable as she lovingly caresses his earlobe and talks to him affectionately. It is clear that we that it is clear they have developed a sexually fulfilling relationship based on her sensitive understanding of his needs and desires. The encounter between Yuma and sex worker Hide, on the other hand, um, and she hires him for her first experience of sexual intimacy is awkward and ultimately disappointing. In contrast to Mr. Kuma's erotic excitement at my sensual touch, Yuma appears uncomfortable as Hide undresses her. Meanwhile, Hide is taken aback by her wheelchair and refuses to kiss her and expresses revolt, repulsion when she accidentally urinates during foreplay. This unvarnished depiction not only exposes a very real issue for paraplegic women navigating sex and intimacy, but also highlights the need for greater empathy in the treatment of people with disabilities. And these disparate experiences expose the way in which disability and gender intersect to marginalize the sexual needs of women with disabilities. As Yesida has observed, women with a physical or a mental impairment must contend with the double burden of the limitations posed by their disability and the cultural and social constructions of womanhood that exist in Japanese society. From an early age, Japanese women are socialized to conform to a definition of femininity that embodies innocence, passivity and nurturance, while men become accustomed to having their needs met first by their mothers and later by their wives. Such stereotypes can prove challenging for a woman whose disability prevents her from taking on a caregiving role. The situation is compounded by the extreme social pressure they face not to be a burden to others, which I discussed earlier, and which often discourages them from asserting their needs and desires. And this is represented in the film in the contrasting reactions of Mr. Kuma and Yuma. While he eagerly encourages Mai to continue her erotic stimulation, Yuma meekly acquiesces, acquiesces to the conditions imposed by um, sex worker Hide on their interaction. And it's to Hikari's credit that she does not allow this one negative experience to dampen Yuma's enthusiasm, instead using it as a conduit to a more satisfying relationship which turns out to be the friendship with, um, um, between Yuma and 
fellow social outsider Mai. Um, it is with the support of open-minded Mai who acts both as a female confidant and nurturing maternal figure that Yuma is able to take the next step in her journey of self-discovery and independence. For Yuma, who has struggled to find her place in conventional society, Mai is one of the few people to see beyond her wheelchair and accept her as an equal. Her other relationships with, with women appear to evoke the unequal power dynamic that can exist between disabled women and able -bodied, the able-bodied women around them, which has been discussed um, in Yasuda's work. Former school friend Sayaka, um, for whom Yuma works as a manga ghost artist, happily takes the credit for Yuma's talent without giving any acknowledgement, even refusing to be seen in public with her. Meanwhile, Yuma is also trapped in a suffocating relationship with overprotective Kyoko, who, do, who not only bathes her, but also monitors where she goes and even what she wears. Denied the flowery pink dresses she loves to wear, Yuma is restricted to simple shirts and trousers in neutral colours, a necessary measure, Kyoko insists, against the legion of creepy men who would attempt to sexually violate her innocent, helpless daughter. Um, however, it's in these depictions of the complex relationships between female characters that 37 Seconds not only reveals the ways in which women with disabilities are denied mainstream social acceptance, it also exposes the strictures that bind able-bodied women who appear to ascribe to their socially prescribed roles. We see this in the hyper-feminized persona of Sayaka um, this, the the hyper-feminized the hyper persona that Saika adopts as the kawaii kogaru, the cute and fashionable teenage girl manga artist she presents to her fans, her pastel colored wigs and bright bows contrasting with the somber casual attire she wears when not in the public eye. Her anxiety over her image, at one point she asks, does my fringe look strange? underlines the level of performativity, to use Judith Butler's phrase, involved in creating and maintaining her highly gendered persona, as well as the extent to which she has become entrapped by its necessitated repetition. Furthermore, we learn that smothering Kyoko, Yuma's mother, is just as much a victim of the codependent relationship that exists between herself and her adult daughter, which has imprisoned both both of the women in a permanent stasis that denies either the opportunity to become fully realized independent women. If Yuma is infantilized because of her disability, Kyoko is also trapped in what Michiko Asai refers to um, as a, the maternal fantasy, an idealized image of purity and selflessness that came to dominate Japanese discourses of motherhood during the second half of the 20th century. Um, Kyoko's refusal to allow Yuma to wear feminine clothing signifies a fear of her daughter's transition to adulthood and eventual independence, which could make the mother's role redundant. It also indicates Kyoko's fear of her own sexuality, which, um, according to Asai's theory, um, was stunted the moment she became the mother of a child with a disability and felt social pressure to relinquish her identity as a woman in order to devote her life to caring for her daughter. This fear is neatly captured in the horrified shriek Kyoko admits when she discovers Yuma's dildo. Thus, when Kyoko polices Yuma's sexuality, she is arguably also attempting to restrain her own. Nevertheless, Kyoko is no beacon of purity. Her repeated warnings of creepy men indicate the extent to which she herself has become preoccupied by sex. As Foucault might say, this attempt to repress her daughter's sexuality as well as her own only pushes it into the realm of secrecy, some subconsciously creating a space for it to flourish. And um, Kyoko's fear is exposed in an argument mother and daughter have in a scene um, that sharing an ironic symmetry with the one discussed earlier also takes place in the bathroom. Um, in the scene, Yuma acknowledges her mother's fears and confronts her with them when she yells, you act like you are sacrificing yourself for me, but you're just afraid of being alone. She, she has pulled herself into the bath at this point to prove to her mother that she's not the helpless child she has been perce perceived to be. 
However, it is when she disappears from Kyoko and Saika's lives that we can truly appreciate how much more they rely on her than she on them. This turning of the tables on Yuma's part underscores the fragility of the able-bodied women's identities, dependent as they are on performing a narrowly defined stereotype of femininity. But, but perhaps Yuma's greatest ability lies in her rich imagination and creativity. Unlike Sayaka, who is forced to appropriate the talent of others because she has none of her own, or Kyoko, who finds solace in the creativity of others, namely Shakespeare, Yuma can both visualize and recreate in manga form a world of her own design, a world that extends beyond the boundaries of existing gender norms or even humanity as we know it. One that allows her to escape her wheelchair and reinvent herself as the great queen of an alien race on a quest to mate with the finest human, human male specimen she can find. This freedom allows Yuma to eventually break free from the toxic relationships that have stymied her and strike out on her own. However, her journey does not necessarily lead her where one might expect. And it is here that the narrative risks reverting to stereotype. Two thirds of the way through the film shifts gear as Yuma uses her newfound independence not to embark on further sexual adventures, but to search for her long lost father and ultimately a sister that she was unaware of. This change of direction in the narrative reflects a similar deviation during the produ production process that occurred after Hikari cast Kayama in the role of Yuma. Although the film had originally meant to be a love story on meeting Kayama at her audition, the filmmaker decided a romance would seem unnatural for the, the to quote, um, to quote um, Hikari, a pure and youthful woman. And she rewrote the script. Kay Kayama's high-pitched tone appeared to bring out Hikari's maternal side. Um, and I'm quoting Hikari again when she says, she has a cute voice, it hums like a mosquito. I just want to wrap my arms around her. In another interview, Hikari added, the other auditionees had serious expressions on their faces but Mei-chan giggled and blushed shyly. I was attracted to her innocence. With these comments, the director was perhaps if inadvertently revealing her own perceived notions of women with disabilities as childlike and asexual, and how these may have influenced her characterization of Yuma. Hikari's description of Yuma is reminiscent of the sweet innocent archetype um, I discussed earlier. And it may explain why, much like other sweet innocent types, Yuma is for the most part respectful, gentle and humble to everyone she meets and brings out the protectiveness of good-hearted, able-bodied people such as Mai and um, Kara Toshia. Alternatively, one could argue that by abandoning the love story, story Hikari has avoided the pitfall that other Japanese films featuring disabled protagonists have fallen into by not excessively romanticizing relationships. Indeed, 37 Seconds Greater Strength is its refusal to patronize its subject by depicting her as especially valiant or spirited. This attitude is most effectively conveyed in the scene in which Yuma submits a sample of her work to an editor of erotic manga. Rather than suggest she uses her disability to market her manga, which according to Saika's editor, uh, Pity Sells, the editor judges Yuma on merit and does not show, shy away from pointing out what the artist needs to do to improve. Go have sex, she insists, without reservation. There is no question in the editor's mind that Yuma is capable of having sex if she puts her mind to it. This simple instruction opens up a world of possibilities for the heroine. As Hikari has noted in an interview, regardless if she's in a wheelchair or not, it's a story about this girl who's trying to make it work for her. The fact that Yuma is ultimately unsuccessful in her quest to have sex is perhaps besides the point. More important is that she has proved that she can if she wants to. Um, and I'd like to say, conclude by saying that both Perfect Revolution and 37 Seconds have pushed boundaries in terms of the representation of disabled people in film and media, both in front of and behind the camera. And, um, but neither of them are you know, perfect. And they also reveal that there is more work to be done in terms of creating media that reflects the diverse identities of disabled people. And I hope my talk today has also showed how um, the 
the way the connections between disability studies and feminist studies and how each can benefit the other. Um, but I'd like to also thank you all so much for listening to me today. And um, this talk is based on a paper that is due to be published later this year, but my research in this area is very much a work in progress. So I look forward to your questions, comments and suggestions. Um, I don't know, I know it's been an hour now. Do we have time to play a clip or is it? Yes, why don't you play your clip and then we can finish. Shall yeah. I? Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just going to um, play the um, the trailer for 37 seconds, which I've, I've already said it's, already, it's available on, on Netflix. So if you do have Netflix, please um, do, do watch it. I recommend it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I know it went a bit over. No, that's fine. Probably, that's yeah, I hope it wasn't too dense. No, that was great. So thank you so much for such a, a wonderfully visual. Uh, and I, I know it's really difficult to flip between clips and, and yeah, no, even I... though we're doing digital <laughs> presentations, it's not that easy to do it. So well done. Um, I don't know if you know, and uh, but Yoshihiko Kumashino, who you were talking about, is actually in the audience. I don't know if he's yes, still here. I did notice that. Yes, uh, yes, it's I did 3 notice. Three a.m. in Japan. I assume he's in Japan. So, and it's three a.m. in Japan. So, I don't know if he is still here, but he was. I in do the see. Audience. Yeah. Yeah. So that's fantastic. So, um, I did say welcome to him. So, if he is here, um, I'm afraid we we can't put people's microphones on or videos on. But you're very welcome to put questions into the Q&A and there, and there are starting to be some questions coming in. I just wanted to ask um, a question myself. Um, I was wondering about the titles of the three films that you were talking about. And my question about the 30 seconds, seconds was actually answered watching the trailer because it was the yeah. seven seconds of, of her not breathing after birth. Yeah, so it's, I, I guess, I just, yeah. yeah. But it represents wondering... that very brief moment in time, which is yeah. the difference between you know, her being disabled and not being yes. disabled, yeah. yeah. But I just wondered if you could comment on the other two. I mean, I'd, I assume it's a coincidence that they both have perfect in the title, perfect revolution and perfect will, but I just wondered if you wanted to comment in any way on the use of that word perfect in both titles and what they're trying to portray through the use of the word perfect in the titles. And it may be different in, in, in the different films, but I just wondered about that. It's a very basic question. I'm yeah, sorry. I mean, I did. I yeah. So yes, it did occur to me as well that obviously this word "perfect" and this idea of perfect and and you know not being perfect um, definitely. Um, I guess yes, it does play with these ideas of what we think of as perfect—a perfect body, a perfect life. Um, I. Mm, I mean, in Perfect Revolution, the two um, characters talk about wanting to um, create this revolution, this way of, you know, to re, to to um, break down barriers, to challenge um, conventional ideas, thinking about disability and also about gender and sexuality. Um, so it's not necessarily referring to wanting to, you know have a have a perfect body or in any sense like that uh, but um yes it's definitely uh, i mean it definitely i think is designed to make and in, in probably in both cases designed to um make the audience um think about ideas you know to re think our ideas of what is perfection is and is it something that needs to be that we should be aiming for hmm. interesting 
well perfection is something that is uh, you know doesn't really exist for anybody does it no exactly yeah <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no it's just interesting that both had the word perfect so I thought I would ask anyway right let's take some questions so uh we have a couple of questions here first so first um has the emboldened patriarchal standard on abled bodies challenged at all by the drastic demographic change of Japan um, has it worsened the sexual sexualities liberation of Japanese women? Um, yeah, so talking about demographic change in Japan, which we all know Japan has yeah. an aging population, etc. Um, um, yeah, tricky, tricky um, question. Tricky to, yeah, I won't have to think about that. What about, so there's a second question here from the same person. Has your research found any connections between the media depictions on disability, sex and gender roles towards an individual's gender identity? Um, I mean, certainly there, um, I think in terms of gender identity, I think there's, as I, I discussed in my talk, there is def definitely this kind of perception that disabled people don't have sex aren't don't have sexual desire and therefore and as sexual desire is very closely linked to gender identity and that way of thinking um certainly in you know this you know patriarchal way of thinking they're very um closely linked um there's this i often certainly women speak of how their you know their identity as women is almost denied um, in the ways that they're kind of told not to, you know, to discouraged from wearing feminine clothing, um, told not to express desires um, in terms of, you know, wanting to become a mother. Um, so I think certainly, yes, there is, um, there is a connection between um, sexuality and gender identity when it comes to disabled people and um obviously you know we see these in these representations in in certainly in 37 seconds and also in perfect revolution where the women are told to tone it tone it down don't be too you know don't don't be too happy and don't be too comfortable in your body and in your sexuality and in your identity as a woman that's not you know, and I mean, these are things that women, you know, don't only um, relate to disabled women. Also, mm -hmm. they relate to, you know, most women um, <laughs> will will find that familiar. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so definitely, I think, I mean, the other aspect of this, which I haven't um, actually um, explored is um, the, I, you know, um, you know, gender dysphoria. Um, or gender identity disorder, as it's sometimes also called, called. And I know that, you know, using these terms in themselves are, can be quite um, controversial because not everybody sees transgender identity as necessarily a disorder or, you know, a something, a disability. But it has, it's certainly in terms of scholarship and in terms of media. Um, so um, the, they are, you know, certainly seen at, by certain, at, you know, scholars and um, parts of the media and society as um, a disabled identity. Um, so, for example, the variety show, the NHK variety show that I discussed, which was Bari Bara, Barrier Free Variety Show, they also discuss issues of um, transgenderism and um, so, uh, gender identity and um, sexuality. And they featured transgender um, presenters and guests. Um, so definitely, there is this sort of identity in terms of identity and non-conforming identities, whether they are, um, you know, a physical disability, um, what we would traditionally consider a physical disability, or. A, um, a learning disability or um, a um or a you know transgender identity they mm. all are very much decide you know uh very much anything that goes against the non-normative um standards that um 
society places on us um, is, is certainly um, will be considered a disability to some. Hmm. Um, a question here, uh, well, first thanking you for a great presentation and then saying it's often the case that able-bodied actors play the role of disabled characters. So is there any discussion on this in, in Japanese public opinion? Um, yes, I mean, I, the examples I've found, they do tend to, um, they do tend to um, use able-bodied actors. Um, uh, so certainly of in the examples I showed, Perfect Revolution and Perfect World. And um, there, is a, there was another film recently, I think it was called I Wanna Hug You. And um, Pure, I think it was a film called Pure White, which featured a, a character with a learning disability. Um, and then there's, you know, there's countless television dramas as well. Um, they do, yes, they, they tend to, in most, almost all cases, it's um, an able-bodied actor, a non-disabled person is um, playing the role of the disabled character. Um, I have not come across many discussions about it, really sort of the, the most, when it's come up, a lot of it, the discussions that I have seen have been um, talking about, you know, when 37 Seconds came out. And um, I should say that it was um, the, the producer of 37 Seconds was actually um, someone who works for NHK. And I know that um, the director has had some, um, I think she won, um, so, um, she was sponsored by NHK or she won some sort of, um, you know, she, she's, she's, I think that the film has been, you know, had input from NHK in it. And um, there, there was, there's a lot, so there was a lot of um, publicity for the film on NHK and the film was shown on NHK in Japan. Um, and so that inspired a lot of discussion. Um, but while the film was praised and the actor, the, le the lead actress was praised, um, you know, as a, you know, a disabled woman playing a, a disabled character, um, there hasn't been much discussion about other media that haven't used um, disabled actors, as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem to be something that is particularly troublesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously these conversations are happening in, in certainly in Western media. Mm. Yeah, it's an emerging conversation. Um, another question here. Um, curious about the analysis you've briefly provided of Yuma's mother in, 30 seconds, in 37 seconds and the, the sexuality of the mother. So obviously she's unable to relinquish her caregiver role over her daughter. Uh, so it's asking whether her view is bolstered by the societal perception or even the eugenics policy of sterilization, which you mentioned, um, but just asking for a bit more analysis of the mother character. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to this whole idea of, um, um, disabled people perhaps you know being ch childlike and remaining childlike um, but I, I mean I think what I was trying to say in my analysis I'm not sure how successfully it came across was this idea that um, it, it's a, lo a lot of these fears about disabled people are really uh, fears about us uh, uh, you know able-bodied people how they feel about themselves when they um, react in this way it, and, and in the case you know it, I guess um, and I'm sure I think Okuyama, Yoshiko Okuyama has spoken about that in her work on um, representations of disability in manga um, that really um, it's a fear of um, something that's to us is abnormal and something we're not used to something that we um, and it's I guess it forces us to question our own ideas of normality and abnormality. Um, in terms of Yuma's mother, um, certainly I feel like her whole identity has is tied up in her role as a mother. 
And that might be the case regardless of whether her child was disabled or not. Mm. But, um, of, you know, because of the way that, you know, motherhood is um, perceived in Japan and um, it's, you know, it's seen as a full time job and should be, you know, a woman's main, you know, her, you know, she should be devoting her whole life to it. And in the case of Yuma, who is disabled, um, in her mother's eyes, she's never going to grow up. She's always going to be mm. that, you know, child. And it's always going to need care and it was always going to need love. Um, but what I'm trying to say is sort of in Yuma, she, in Yuma, um, Kyoko sees her own her her own um, life, which was stymied, her own desires, which have been repressed in order to fulfill this role. You know, she kind of her life paused when she became a mother. And it has never, she's never been able to really restart it and, and carry on. And what does she do if Yuma isn't there? If mm. Yuma leaves. So presumably she, she's a single mother because and she's said a, that, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes. Well, you, a, you did yeah. say that she goes in search of her father. Yeah. So I don't know yes. if she finds the father or. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I mean, I think I didn't want to take to make too much of the fact that she's a single mother because mm. um, it, it's possible that even if she hadn't her husband hadn't left her she might you know mm. she might still have been the way she was just because this is what's expected of her yeah as, sure. as the mother of a child and not just any child but a child yeah. who, who is disabled yeah thanks um one here uh, saying again thank you for your presentation saying I haven't watched Perfect World but my wife was enthusiastic about it um, there's a Japanese um, I don't know if it's a TV commercial uh, uh, Mum's yeah. Cafeteria or Car San Shokudo and some high school girls are protesting against it and um, uh, oh sorry it's a series high school girls in Japan are protesting against it because they're saying you know housework is not mm. just for mothers but the movement is not so widespread so how do you anticipate that Japanese understanding of gender and disability will change in the future? So I guess it's asking about, you know, the momentum. Yeah. Um, and also saying um, I'm Japanese, so my understanding of Japan depends on the context and thanking you for, as a non-Japanese researcher, making us aware of things. So I don't know if that um, that commentator is in Japan or not, but if you are, yeah. I, I hope you're surviving at 3 a.m. and that you may you may well be outside of Japan. But thank you for the question. Yeah. Do you want to comment on that? Sure. I mean, this idea and um, sort of these representations of um, women in these sort of, um, you know, housebound roles as mothers, as carers, as, you know, housekeepers, cleaners, cooks. You know, and the protests against it have, you know, been seem to have been going on, you know, since before I was born, certainly, it's, you know, since the 70s, when um, the, um, the women's liberation groups, the women's lib groups, um, you know, um, um, were protesting against these things. And there were quite some quite famous protests against um, 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 commercials for example you know there was quite a famous house instant ramen commercial I think it was um, and so these these stereotypes have been perpetuated you know since you know the beginning of, of media I guess but it you know and they don't seem to go away that's the thing and um, you know it's I kind of it's the way I see things is that it's more it's um it's just things go 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 round in circles it's just like things it tends to be circular or at least maybe sort of ups and downs in terms of just when we think that we've got somewhere and we're making progress then there's a backlash and then things revert to the norm and then again there's another round of protests um it's not just japan it's you know i think it, it happens everywhere um but certainly in japan obviously i th you know there are structural issues in terms of the way the economy has been structured around men working 
women staying at home. And um, I mean, these are issues that I can't really go into to in, in much depth right now, but um, obviously those structural issues need to be sorted out. Mm. Um, at the same time, women's work in the home or anyone, any work in the home, not necessarily women's work, it's not necessarily women's work, but any work in the home also I feel is work. And I feel that that needs to be compensated and needs to be um, recognized as, uh, you know, of, of value. Of value. Um, but also we need to make it easier for women to, um, to work outside the home. Mm. Um, and this is something that people have been talking about forever, I feel, but it just obviously, <laughs> you know, until we have more, you know, female representation in all, you know, all fields of, of life, of society, then I, I'm not sure how, how far that's going to, we're going to get. Mm. But it's actually quite, well, going back, your answer for this and your answer to the previous question, it's actually refreshing in a way that not only are these films emerging and, and having much more realistic portrayals of, of disability and, and acknowledging, you know, sexuality and disability. But as you said, maybe, you know, th these depictions of motherhood in Japan are so strong and so prevalent that at the same time, these, these films are sort of subtly um, depicting motherhood as well. So as you said, it maybe it doesn't really matter that this mother has a disabled daughter. Maybe it's the fact that she has to confront her own overwhelming motherhood and, and get to grips with her daughter's sexuality, whether the daughter is disabled or not. So in some ways yeah. it's kind of depicting, mm. it's kind of criticizing motherhood in a way, which is kind of refreshing as well as an underlying element maybe. So that's quite an interesting idea you've put there. Um, uh, a question here from Heather Jokins, who says she's SOAS alumni, so welcome Heather. Um, she says, in a lot of disability narratives about love, there's always the emphasis on completion, usually when it comes to finding love. So this is something she sees in Western media as well as Japanese media whenever there's a, dis you know, a disabled person in the story. So she just wanted to know how this completeness, this finding love, is framed in Japanese media. Is it bodily? Is it spiritually? How are the narratives trying to complete the disabled character? Really good question. I mean, I think this completeness also goes towards sort of storytelling and narrative arcs in terms of wanting to find a, a satisfying conclusion for the, um, the audience. Um, but certainly um, in terms of, I mean, if we look at just the, the films that we, that, the, the media that I've introduced today, um, certainly if we take Perfect World, which, I mean, that was a TV drama, but it, it's also a film and there's a manga as well, which I think is ongoing. So that might not have completed, but in terms of the film and the television drama, there was a very kind of, you know, tr you've got the very conventional completion in the fact that eventually the couple after facing all these obstacles, they get married. Um, you know, so that they've, event, you know, they're eventually off and some to toing and throwing about whether they should be together. But eventually, you know, there you've got this very concrete sort of marriage ceremony at the end of it, um, which is a very conventional way of completing, a, you know, a love story, whether it's, you know, features mm. disabled people or not, in terms of, and I mean, kind of similarly, in terms of perfect revolution, you've got this same you kind of think at one point that they're not, you know, there's all these things in, 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 the, in their case, what's really um, sort of um, pro, um, hindering their relationship is um, Mitsu's um, personality disorder, um, which I, I kind of feel that's the one sort of area where they, they didn't, don't explore it in the way that I, I hope they would, but I guess there's only so much you can do with one film, but um, with that, that's what's keeping them apart, and she's eventually institutionalised, but at the end, I feel like I'm just giving away the endings to these things, but, <laughs> but in the end, they do end up together, kind of in a final crazy scene. So, which is hard, you know, and I think what, um, having read a, a bit about the making of the, the film, um, they wanted to make it a, um, it wasn't, it's, it's a lighthearted story, essentially. Mm. And it's about, even though there, I feel like there are some serious themes in that, 
Um, but it's a romantic story. It's meant they've they described it as a date movie. It should be a movie that you can take a date to. Um, mm. And it just so happens that they, you know, the protagonists are disabled. Mm. Um, but it's it's just it's so it's in that sense it's a conventional love story, and they do end up together at the end. Mm. You know, um, in terms of Yuma, it's a little bit different in that it, it started off being you know planned as a love story but it uh but it's more i guess it's more about her finding completion within herself in terms of her independence and her completion as a kind of a mature independent woman um sort of wanting to ex um explore her se sexuality um but also wanting to um, explore her identity. Who is she? Is she just this disabled woman or is, can she be something more? You know, there's more to her than that. There's more to life than that for her. And so in the end, it's not necessarily about finding um, happiness or fun with someone else. It's about um, being independent because she's always with people. There's always someone with her to look after her, to protect her um to use her <laughs> you know there's always someone there but you know so this is about her striking out on her own mm. okay great um a question here from selma thank you for this eye-opening presentation most discussions certainly focus on visible disabilities, but now we're seeing more awareness on invisible disabilities within the spectrum of disability. Um, so have there been more discussions on invisible disability in Japan and how it's perce perceived in society? So you did mention that in um, one of the films, you know, there is that personality disorder. So in that sense, yeah. in, but you, you know, it didn't go too far, perhaps. So yeah, is, is it opening up a broader discussion on invisible disabilities in Japan? Absolutely, yeah. And um, certainly things like, I think there's, um, certainly you will find um, depictions of, for example, autism spectrum disorders. Um, and um, certainly um, the, the Bally Bada program, they, they have done quite a, a few segments on that. Um, and there have been quite a few um, television dramas uh, about these, about autism spectrum disorder. Um, I feel like um, sort of mental illness still is not necessarily as um, talked about in the media, certainly not in many positive contexts. Um, it's still very much viewed as a problem to be fixed, I think. Um, um, I mean, I think as I, as, as I kind of discussed briefly, but I didn't go into, into much depth, and this is not an area that I, I have um, um, researched in much depth yet, um, but certainly there is, I think because of this concept that, um, you know, they have, in Japan, you have this concept of um, kuki or yomu or kuki or yomenai, mm. yeah. you know, you've got to be able to, I don't know, say, read the room, read the Read the air, read the room, read, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a very important part of um, na navigating social relationships in Japan. And for people who are not able to do that in the conventional way, that that can cause in some ways, as I said, with them um, in terms of, you know, disability, some disabilities have visible markers, you know, you have wheelchairs, you have a cane, you, you know, different things to show, you know, to, as a mar marker of disability, but with, when it comes to things like um, mental illness or learning disabilities, you don't necessarily have those visual cues straight away. And even when you do, even when you you receive, you realize that you know this person, a person has, you're dealing with someone who has that disability. It's not necessarily um, the understanding of how to deal with that, how to cope with that. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly I, these conversations are starting to, to happen. They're start, you know, they're opening up and, um, you know, these people are, um, their voices are starting to be heard. But I think there is obviously a lot, you know, more, there's more, there's, there's more to be done. There's, there's a longer way to go with that. Um, 
but yes, I mean, most um, scholars and activists say that it, it's actually um, more difficult for people who don't present as disabled um, because they won't be as com accommodated mm -hmm. as, you know, as someone who has a visible marker of disability. Um, a question here from Anna um, asking, what has been the reaction of um, disabled communities in Japan? especially disabled women to the depiction of sex and pleasure of a disabled woman in the film 37 seconds. So I guess, you know, we yeah. have been talking about, we always sort of focus what's the reaction to, you know, more broadly in society when, yeah. when really, of course, Absolutely. we should be focusing well, on the reaction yeah. of the community I mean, itself as well. <laughs> I think, I mean, partly due to the timing of when it was released, which was towards the end of 2019. And I think it was shown in early 2020 on NHK, but probably mm. not at a time where it was seen by that many people. But um, I'm not sure how widely the film has actually been seen in Japan generally, but in terms of dis the reaction from disabled people, as far as I, what I, from what I've read, it seems to be very positive in terms of um, and in, in general, I've not seen any reactions from the mainstream media or from um, disabled groups um, that is negative. I think um, people see it as a positive mm. um, depiction of disability. And um, I haven't seen any um, criticism for example, or of the way that, you know, sex, sexuality is portrayed in the film. So, as, yeah, as far as I'm aware that I've not seen it, you know, it's mm. been positive. Well, it's great that it's picked yeah. up by Netflix as well. I mean, that's that's really Yeah, cool. but I think perhaps in some ways it, that, uh, that kind of, I mean, it, it's good, but it hasn't been released on DVD yet. So, right. okay. in a, yeah. you know, if you have Netflix and you're aware of it, but it's not necessarily been marketed, particularly, um, you know, in terms of Netflix, um, you know, mm. sort of when you go into Netflix, it's not, I don't think it's been heavily marketed. Mm. Um, but certainly, I mean, it won, you know, it's an award winning, it won um, an award at the Berlinale, the, you know, the film festival at, in Berlin. So certainly there's been a lot of, um, it has had quite a lot of, attention in you know on the festival circuit it's been shown at quite a few different um um festivals um but yeah but perhaps domestically it's um you know i mean it probably isn't a date movie <laughs> so <laughs> unlike perfect revolution so yeah mm. okay um so patrick asks um Patrick says, sorry to ask a question about COVID. I don't think we can get away from COVID, so we don't mind, yeah. Patrick. And um, wondering if there's any developments in the discussion of disability in Japan since COVID, because um, he's suggesting maybe that, you know, the pandemic has made uh, technology more widespread and more, you know, we're using yeah. it socially and business, you know, every day, essentially. So is that, you know, is it, obviously that's useful for people with mobility disabilities. So has it, I guess he's asking, has it sort of helped the discussion of disability in Japan, our current digital world that we live in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the simple answer is that I, I don't really know. It's not mm. something that I, I have looked at. Um, yeah, no, I, yeah, uh, um, I mean, I've not seen, I mean, I think there are other scholars who are looking at sort of disabilities, and I'm, I'm sure that there was a podcast recently that I remember listening to last year, but I'm trying to think who it was. Is it, it's Mark Borman, is it, who looks at sort of disability? Not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah um yeah i'm sorry I, I i i don't really have an answer for how sort of things have developed in the, the past mm. past year or so um no that's fine obviously I mean, it's, it must, it's, there must have been an impact yeah yeah in terms of you know services being provided and not being provided mm. um no it's a very good question patrick so if anybody out there is looking yeah. for a phd topic that would be more i'm, I'm sure that, yeah i know <laughs> I'm sure someone has, does have an answer. So if anyone does, um, you know, it'd be great yeah. if you could 
you could give us your answer. Mm. Well, I mean, there's so much starting to emerge about how the pandemic is obviously impacting on women and gender roles, you know, universally, mm. not just in Japan, but everywhere in terms of having more impact on women because of that juggling of home and, and work. And so, you know, it's the, those types of that type of research is starting to emerge quite a lot now yeah. so it'd be nice if other aspects of impact of pandemic like on disability for example would emerge so great question Patrick sorry we can't answer it right now but hopefully you know that's something that is going to emerge um, so Jenny asks in terms of Mitsui's personality disorder how have you come across translations of the terms uh, and she's put a Japanese term. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I can read it correctly. Is it shiteki shogai? Is it shiteki shogai? Yeah. Um, so she says maybe they're quite problematic in terms of their translation. Um, yeah, story. I mean, yeah. So asking in about term, yeah. yeah, in terms of Mitsu's personality disorder, it's actually it, I don't think it's referred to as shiteki shogai. I think it's referred to as jinkaku shogai. So it's okay. quite literally personality disability. I think is. Um, I, I mean, I, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't know about government white papers and how, how the terms are used. So yeah, again, I'm, um, I, I'm not sure I can answer that one. Um, certainly I did find the sort of, um, and I believe, although I only have the DVD in Japanese, I do believe that when it was shown at film festivals in, with English subtitles, it was literally translated as personality disorder, which from within the Western context, certainly um, the term personality disorder is very broad and can cover a multitude of things. And so this is why, where I say that the film perhaps does not um, open up that area, of that discussion as much as perhaps it could, um, because although we, we do learn something about her background, her sort of her, basically she was neglected as a child and mistreated by her mother. And, and that it's, it's, it's basically, that's given as the reason for her developing this personality disorder, um, which yes, in a way kind of blames the mother for, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily like uh, we're told that she's sent to, uh, you know, she's she's institutionalized, um, but we don't really see her in that environment, except at the very end when she leaves. Um, so we don't see her rehabilitation. We don't see her, um, you know, how she over, you know, how the treatment that she receives. And I, I, I do feel that that side of it was not explored perhaps sufficiently. Um, and obviously it, I think it becomes a heavier topic and a heavier film if, if you are to do that, um, you know. And again, we, we, we don't, you know, we don't see, you know, Kuma's journey as well. Um, we just, you know, we see him as an adult and he's very much accepting of his, body and his life and what he wants and you know um he and he's very successful um so I, I do feel like there is something you know they are not um I guess I guess to, in a way I mean I guess you know it avoids that whole sort of narrative of someone you know overcoming adversity mm -hmm. and things like that and um which is definitely something to, you know, to applaud. Um, but yes, I do think in terms of like sort of these personality disorders and mental illnesses, these are issues that have not necessarily been explored in sufficient depth in um, most media. So I think that's definitely, and I'm sure that part of that is to do with sort of a general kind of fear and ignorance. And I'm sure that is perpetuated in, by sort of um, media discourse and official discourse. Mm. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. So I'm just gonna, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry if we haven't answered all the questions, I'm just gonna pick another couple really quickly. Um, so there's um, an interesting question here from Teresa saying, 
the disabled characters in the films you mentioned are, you know, are employed or making money, if she remembers correctly. So, yeah. but how is it with employment versus unemployment rates amongst the Japanese disability community? And, and in what light is it portrayed? Yeah. In Japan? yeah, good question. So absolutely. So yeah, so in, yes, definitely um, in, the, in the first imperfect world, he's an architect, I believe. And um, in um, Kuma, in Perfect Revolution, he's a yeah, you know, he's an activist, activist, and it's based on you know the real life um, yeah. Kumashino. So um, you know he's an author, mm. um, you know, and you know promotes disabled rights. Um, and yes, Yuma is as in, is employed as a ghostwriter, but she's not able to to take credit for her work. She has to have someone else, you know, be the face mm. uh, of it. But yes, yeah. Uh, um, in terms of the real life sort of rates of employment, I'm I don't I have seen the figures. I've got the figures somewhere. I don't have them to hand, but they are sort of mid tiny. Sort of you know, we're talking about single figures, a very small percentage of people who are employed, mm. um, um, who, you know, who have disabilities. So um, yes, there is definitely um, an issue with that um, um, in terms of, yeah, sort of making society. Um, I, think, I think still very much Japanese attitudes in general towards disability very much still follow the medical um, model rather than the social model. So mm -hmm. rather than, you know, they see um, see disability as a problem to be fixed, we need to perhaps fix the world so that it's a more, um, you know, a more um, friendly environment for people mm -hmm. with disabilities mm -hmm. in terms of accessing um, education and work opportunities. Um, but certainly it's, you no, know, there's still very much this idea of not being a burden mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, disability is still very much seen as a burden, whether it's in the school or the workplace. So in schools as well, a lot of, um, you know, schools will refuse to take um, disabled children, even if they're supposed to. So, mm. um, you know, there's there's many issues with that that still have to be overcome. Mm, interesting. I mean, maybe that goes back to the the previous question about the, what impact will the pandemic have in terms of opening up possibilities, which which is a nice maybe the one good thing that might come out of the pandemic. So I'll just take the final question from Marcos Centeno, who's a, a colleague of ours at Birkbeck and formerly of the SOAS JRC. Um, he said he missed the first part, so he wasn't sure if you had mentioned other films um, that come to his mind, such as uh, Goodbye CP and um, the Minamata series. And so he said they're documentary films made as part of a film, uh, filmmaker's activism and commitment to social issues. So could you compare, so basically asking, do you see yeah. 37 Seconds as also sort of militant cinema or, has, or does it have different goals? Um. I think I'm not sure if I can consider it's militant cinema in the way that the other, um, you know, the documentary films mm. um, that Marcus has mentioned. Um, and thank you very much for the comment, Marcus. Um, I think, you know, as I think the way Hikari put it um, in terms of, you know, this is a story of one girl. It's a, just a story. It's not the story of disabled people. It's a story mm. of one disabled person. Yeah. It's important not to generalize, yeah. isn't it? Uh, and I very much think that, you know, from everything I've read about the production, um, I very much feel like that is the way that, um, you know, that these films are meant to be seen. Um, and what we need are more of these stories rather than, um, rather than making one, have it, that's the thing, when you don't have that many representations mm. of an identity, you tend to put both, both, uh, you know, you tend to put too hinge too much on that one representation, um, and that representation has to do a lot of work. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a big burden to carry. Yeah. And you, I don't think you can. You obviously you cannot do that with one film or even one mm. with one TV series. You know. So what we need are more of these stories, and some of them are going to be, um, you know, they're going to be. Uh, 
really, you know, challenging and, you know, very, you know, pushing boundaries. And some of them aren't. Mm. Some of them are just going to be romantic, lighthearted romantic stories where one of the protagonists is disabled or something like that. Mm. Um, just like we have good and bad films and TV shows about able-bodied people or, you know, it's just I think what we need is we need we just need to see more of these representations and I think that's where you get the change in terms of um making getting society to to view um people with diverse identities in it you know in a more progressive way in a more accepting way and getting away from these binaries of good and bad, mm. you know, um, in term, yeah. So I, I, I'm not sure that militant cinema is the right description for it. Um, but obviously, you know, more militant images also probably have their place as well. Mm. Um, I think, I think with, certainly I think with 37 seconds, um, as I said, you know, I, I kind of, kind of that, that shift towards the end of the movie where it's, a, you know, she, she, she goes off to find her sister and it comes a little bit more, more of a conventional story. Um, it's, I mean, I think at first I kind of, when I first watched it, I, I was not, I, I felt a little bit sort of dissatisfied by the ending, but um, having read about it and thinking about it, you know, I don't think we, we, I don't think we can expect everything from one movie or one representation. Mm. Well, I mean, that's a great comment to, to end on, that this is just the start and hopefully there will, there's lots more to come. And, um, it, you know, it's great to see diversity emerging in Japan and being on the agenda, you know, whether it's dealing with women, um, you know, mixed heritage mm -hmm. Japanese, disability, LGBTQ communities. Um, you know, there's so much going on now, isn't there? And, and it, the spotlight is turning on different communities in Japan or the diversity of communities in Japan and immigration and all sorts of things. So I think that's really positive. And as you said, um, you didn't say it in your talk, but we had it on our, on our advertising materials with the Paralympics, hopefully, yeah. maybe <laughs> coming up <laughs> this year in Japan. Yeah. The, the spotlight will be on disability and sport, which is always a fantastic event. And yeah. I'm sure Tokyo would do a great job if it, if it goes ahead. So fingers crossed. So thank you so much, Forum. And thank you to everybody who joined us. And we have more series. Uh, we have more coming up. So keep an eye out on our Wednesday seminar series. But Thank you so much for bringing such a, you know, offering insight into such an important uh, topic. And like you say, hopefully we'll see lots more to come on these themes. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone for, um, for first of all, um, turning up and your um, really insightful and interesting comments and questions. Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And sorry if we didn't get to your question. Uh, we will send the chat on to forum so that she can see yeah. the ones that we couldn't we couldn't get to. But thank you all. Um, oh, and, and Kumashino has said um, he said goodbye at 4 a.m. in Japan. So, well, he was joining us, which was yes. So that's that's fantastic. OK, thank you, everybody. I'll say, we'll say goodnight. And thanks to Charles, who's behind the scenes running these webinars. Um, we're going to stop recording yeah. now and say goodbye. But thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Forum. Good night.